So we're doing something slightly different with the camera, uh, just a little bit different. I know I'm basically a talking head anyways, so some of you may not give a damn about the presentation visually. And since I'm officially making MP3s of these things and putting them out on my podcast nowadays, some of you may not actually give a damn in general. But I thought I'd go ahead and try it out, see what you guys think, so feel free to give me some feedback on that one. We're actually doing, uh, obviously, the webcam's in a slightly different position, desk is a little bit different, green screen's a little bit different, so like I said, let me know. <coughs> so, <coughs> welcome to the Klingons, TNG style. No, seriously, it's so weird going back with uh, the advantage of hindsight and looking at an episode like this, because... What we are seeing is basically the Klingons being remade before our very eyes. This is also kind of funny, since obviously I'm going through DS9 at the same time as I'm going through TNG. And over on DS9, they're doing the same damn thing. With the Ferengi, with the Cardassians, with the Bajorans, with the Trill. In fact, they will kind of do this with the Klingons as well. But I bring this up, obviously there are some aspects of the Klingons that were established back in TOS and back in the movies that had come out to date, uh, most notably Star Trek III, The Search for Spock had already kind of done some work with the Klingons. But for the most part, we didn't really get what would become known as the Klingons until this episode right here. This one really establishes a lot of things about them, and I thought about making a full list, I kind of gave up about halfway through, because it's a decent list. You know, the yell... The concept of what they're doing with Stovacor and, and their emphasis on the afterlife in an everyday modern element, uh, the corpse being a shell, their contention with and yet adherence to the Federation. One little thing I liked is the captain of the the Katinga, I forget the name of the ship, you know, the, the battle cruiser, actually has a Federation logo over his right shoulder in addition to the Klingon Empire logo over his left shoulder. It's not subtle in the strictest sense of the word, But it is a nice way to emphasize how this alliance is a full military-grade, diplomatic, economic, etc. alliance. And I like that. And that'll be important in the future, too. This also establishes a little bit of how Klingon politics work and how, uh, you know, the whole dying in battle on their feet, blah, blah, blah. There's several aspects of it that, that will be expanded upon in the future. Also, you notice Picard is surprising, well, I shouldn't say surprisingly, but he is very comfortable with the Klingons. I don't know if that was done as a deliberate counterpoint to Kirk, who's, you know, let's be honest, his main nemesis was basically the Klingons throughout his run. But it will also be very important in the future. Picard's, uh, he's very comfortable with and very competent with the Klingons. And this will be true in basically all of Picard's run. It's actually something that I've always found rather endearing and interesting about his character is that whenever whenever he comes up against a Klingon, he's got this. He relates to them and diplomatizes with them, diplomatizes with them, excuse me, pretty much perfectly. Just bam, yep, nope, I got this. Now, I also want to say that this is pretty much the first time, in fact, I think this is literally the first time Vaughn Armstrong decided to join the Star Trek roster of characters. Now... There's actually a couple of guest stars, uh, Von Armstrong being one of them, that are among my favorite guest star actors in Star Trek. Now, I can't actually remember the name of the other guy. He was the guy who played the Admiral in The Defector. Uh, He also played the... uh, uh, He was in Voyager as this insane... Well, not insane, but this scientist who had crafted a super weapon in uh, early season one. Anyways, that guy's another one, but... When I say that, I don't mean like Barkley or Q or Galron. Those are guest stars where you're playing the same character throughout the course of the series. What I mean is when you have a specific actor who plays multiple roles throughout the series. Now, and, and so, so it's kind of a different category. And Von Armstrong has always been a favorite of mine in that particular regard. He's good. I like him. I even liked him in Enterprise. Come at me. Now... What's funny is if you're watching this show, you know, live as it's coming out, you might notice we've already covered Vom Armstrong, so I'm not going to talk too much more about him. You might be like, well, wait, he wasn't in TNG. No, he was in DS9 a few weeks ago. Actually, at this point, a few months ago, I think, at this point, he was as uh, uh, Dinar. I had to write his name because it wasn't Damar. That's the wrong guy. Dinar over in D-Space 9. He was actually pretty decent over there, too, as a Cardassian, so go figure. I also want to say that this episode, while it is a good episode, I liked it. It's nice to be able to have what is basically a 
a positive episode in season one TNG without having to say asterisk. Um, it is interesting to see. This is our first real uh, focusing on Worf episode. I mentioned we already had our first Worf episode last one with Coming of Age. But this is really Worf's episode. He is the guest. He is the primary focused guest of this episode. The thing is, we don't... It's, it doesn't really work that well as a Worf episode. I want to talk about why. But in order to talk about why, we have to talk about Spock. Start... <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry. One moment. <clears throat> As you can tell, my throat is still not quite completely healed. Spock was the outsider. Half human, half Vulcan. He didn't really belong in the Vulcans, didn't really belong in the humans, and that's pretty much one of his biggest character arcs throughout everything Spock is in. God's sakes, even the recent Abrams films, that was still Spock's character arc. In fact, one of the things I liked most about the 2009 film was that Spock felt most Vulcan in Starfleet because he felt like such an outsider amongst the Vulcans, but I digress. So I mention this because that is, you know, that's a good thing. You know, Obviously, Leonard Nimoy is amazing, was amazing, and has done some great stuff with Spock over the years. But that established a trend, and a trend that has continued in basically every Star Trek since. The outsider character, the person who doesn't quite fit in, usually has to do with their lineage, you know, blood. And this is a common thing. I've, I've actually mentioned this already over in Voyager, the idea that, you know, one of the weird things Star Trek tends to do is you, you, know, you have to be with your people, right? You know, you have to be who you are kind of a thing. DS9 and TNG will both play with this as we go throughout this series. Interestingly enough... This very episode plays with that. It doesn't play it completely straight like later episodes will, where you must be with your people. But that's how we see Worf in this, and this is basically the beginning of Worf actually having a goddamn character arc, is he is an outsider. He's repeating the Spock thing. He is a full-blooded Klingon who serves on a Federation ship, and as we learn, he was actually raised by humans. And yet he still adheres to Klingon tradition and concept. Now, I don't want to discuss too much of what I call the Worf concept, the Worf character arc. I will be discussing that later. But we see the very first beginning hints and tidbits of that, even here, all the way back in season one, episode 19 or 20, or whatever the hell we're up to at this point. Now, the other reason I bring this up for why this doesn't quite work is because too much of it is just facts. We do see a little bit of actual character development, mostly in the form of Chorus. Chorus actually serves as an excellent example of Worf's character. But Worf himself basically just exposits. In fact, Michael Dorn had the same general concern. Worf just says, I was this and I was that. I mean, it's, it's, it feels like it's not exactly bad. You know, it's not terrible. I want to stress that. But it really does feel like, or I'll use my own notes as an example, it feels like Worf, you know, Michael Dorn, just got up there and started saying, oh, I am from this place and this is my backstory, you know, right? Hey, picture you're sitting down to play D&D &D for the first time and everyone's like, all right, what's your character? Well, I'm from this place and this is what... That's kind of how it felt. Now, I know exposition is a, is a difficult mistress to handle. Trust me, I understand. And I get that there's you know, issues, especially since this early in season one. And again, it wasn't terribly presented. Some good directing, some good camera angles helped to salvage things. And again, some pretty good guest star performances, most notably, as I mentioned, Vaughn Armstrong. And Michael Dorn isn't exactly a bad actor, so he does some good stuff to salvage it too. But it did feel like it felt a little flat for basically being our first real Here's Wharf episode. Now, before I continue talking about Wharf and Chorus and Conmo and all that, I want to talk about Ron Jones and how he just is so amazing. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. The teaser for this one is immediately tense. It starts off, and what's the first thing we hear? No dialogue, no captain's log, just... Dun -dun 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 -dun. You know, just this deep, tense music playing. And we immediately know, oh, God, something's going wrong. And then we cut to the bridge, and everything's fine, but within seconds, we're getting a distress call, and it's like, okay, dun 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 dun, -dun, -dun. And I just want to mention that between the combination of the visual effects, the music, the direction, and the cast, a lot of this episode is far more atmospheric than it really has any right to be. 
a lot of these situations are not actually big deals. They're not particularly significant. If, if you pull yourself out of the moment and you're just reading pa- pe- word, letters on a page, it's like, okay, and? But presentation salvages it. One of my favorite examples of this is when they go over to the freighter, the Torellian freighter, or Tellerian. I forget if it's Tellerian or Torellian. They actually screw this up in the episode. So forgive me for similarly screwing up. It's one of the two. Anyways, they go over the freighter. And it's like, okay. So they're over on the freighter. And there's a few moments, and these are the only moments that don't really work for me, where we get this sort of sense of wonderment as they're playing with Jordy's visor. Now, this is going to sound weird, but that's actually my biggest complaint about this entire episode. It feels very out of place. You know, we've got this big, tense thing. Oh, my God, we need to go over to the freighter, and everything's wrong, and, oh, we got it. There's been, a, there's been Romulans. Oh, my God, we haven't heard Romulans in, in so long, and it's not actually the Ferengi. By the way, once again, just pointing it out, because I'm going to keep pointing it out in Season 1, once again, we see the Romulans slotting in instead of the Ferengi. They even name-dropped the Ferengi in this episode as a consequence of this, this change in policy uh, out of character. But no, it's the Romulans, and oh god, this is this is a trap, number one. Agreed. And then there's just this sudden, like Ron Jones does this great wonderment music of, oh my gosh, and this is what he looks like, and that's Riker, and oh, and here's Data, and how do you learn to look? And we do get some pretty decent exposition about Geordi. We get some insight into his character by virtue of learning how he perceives Literally, and obviously, you know, literally, because we're seeing it. But I also mean the fact that he can filter all this out. That this is normal for him. That he actually looks at the world in a different way. And I don't just mean because of the fact that he's blind. It's a nice little tidbit. Problem is that scene works in a vacuum, but it detracts from the entire rest of the episode, which otherwise is very tense and very dramatic. In fact, it's even weirder when Riker comes up and says, "Captain, we're got kind of an emergency situation here." Remember, when they finally beam off this freighter, they beam off with seconds to spare and almost don't. If they hadn't spent all that time wonderminting in the beginning, they would have been fine. So, ignoring that then, they start actually going through the ship, and it is surprisingly tense. And again, I love that presentation of this because it makes me feel like this is a real situation. Because we've got a ship... And they actually mentioned that the massive output of either radiation or energy or whatever that the, 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 the leaking or destroyed engine is putting out is interfering with most of their standard technologies. You know, scanners being a big one, but the most important one being the beamers, uh, the transporters. So they can't just beam in and out like they otherwise could. They couldn't even 100% tell if there were life forms on board that ship. So the only way to actually deal with this is with an away team, and that away team is putting themselves in deadly danger. This is how you arrange a situation in which, despite the massive technological advancement of the Enterprise and the incredible tools at their disposal, you have challenged your protagonists. I've talked about this so much in Star Trek, and in all my works, really. Because it's not, the goal is not survive. I mean, that's not going to thro- pose any threat to the galaxy class, right? Even if it exploded right next to it, they'd probably be fine. No, that's not the problem. The problem is trying to rescue those people on there. Once you make that goal something that is something very precise like that, then you can make the goal hard to accomplish, and then you can challenge your protagonists rather than trying to make it a direct threat. You'll notice the Enterprise, with one minor exception, is never actually threatened in this episode. It doesn't need to be, because that's not the point. So they go over and they make their way through. Like I said, very tense scene. Uh, good stuff, good stuff. Um... I want to I want to mention one other thing that they do. And I, I just want to point this out because I know a lot of my viewers who are watching this have watched Voyager and Enterprise and even late TNG. There's a problem in later Star Trek where, for example, I'm a way team person and I'm on the comm with whoever's on the ship. And I'm like, hey, I found something. And they say, what is it? And I'm saying, well, it's, you know, it might be this or it's going to be difficult to describe this or you better check this out for yourself, sir. You know what I mean, right? I don't answer the question directly. And God, that drives me crazy, especially when it's so easy to explain it in some cases. And it's usually done specifically just to pad out the, the episode a little bit more. So it's like, oh my gosh, right? Here, 
Riker goes in and they see them. And what does Riker say? Within seconds, he just says one word. Klingons. And everyone's like, oh, Klingons. Okay, yes, we're, we're adapting. We know what we're doing now. We got this. And I like that because that's exactly what should happen. What have we found? Klingons. Bam! Information conveyed. Right? We don't need to get into specifics yet. We can work that out when we're not in danger. But right now, we found people. Klingons. Let's go. Right? I like that. Now, I want to give special praise to the actors, you know, Von Armstrong and I don't know his name, who played Chorus and Conmel. When they're recounting their battle against the Ferengi, who are actually uh, not Ferengi, as we find out later, uh, they come across as immeasurably pleased with themselves. Like, yes, we were able to accomplish this great victory. And And they do it in a way that doesn't come across as smug, just happy about it. And I like that because most actors, in my experience, when told to act proud of something by a director or whatever act smug about something so credit to both of them or their director you know however this works out for managing to be pleased about something without getting into irritating aggravating or like i say smug territory so then there's another great bit and this is awesome once again we see a lot of the klingon culture being developed in this episode because there's a scene where Conmel and Chorus both just start provoking Worf, deliberately, blatantly, practically slapping him on the face. Not literally, of course, because as we know, that's a death challenge right there. And Worf says, why are you doing this? He keeps in control of himself because of course he does. He's freaking Worf. <laughs> and the other two say, ah, we're just trying to make sure it happens. That is such a Klingon thing. We are provoking you to see if you're still Klingon. In fact, one of the things that will be very common for Klingon culture from now on is for Klingons to deliberately provoke allies or fellow comrades at arms or other Klingons specifically because they want that response. They're testing you in the literal sense of the word. There are plenty of times in the future where a Klingon's going to be like, oh, you're pathetic. And then when they're slugged, physically assaulted in response, their response is awesome because that's exactly the reaction they wanted. The, uh, so then, you know, here's the whole, uh, Worf's exposition comes in, as I said, kind of flat, already kind of commented on that, and it is weird how understanding and relatable Chorus is, considering that he's also kind of crazy. I'll talk about that in a moment, the crazy part, but there's plenty of times where he understands Worf. And he gets him. He even understands some of the other people. There's a scene that I actually love, and I know this sounds bizarre. It's the scene where the little girl pours up, and he picks him up, picks the girl up, looks at Worf, and then gives her to Worf. Because of course he does. He may be crazed, but he is a crazed Klingon, not a Klingon politician. And we will discuss the difference between Klingon politicians and Klingon warriors because it will come up a lot in TNG and DS9. But he is a crazed Klingon warrior. The idea of taking that girl as a hostage or trying to hurt her probably never even occurred to him. You can even see it, credit to Von Armstrong and or the director, when Yara's like, we've got a hostage situation. He looks over at that situation, he's like, wait, oh, no, no. <laughs> like, he, he doesn't, he's, it's not flippant. But you can almost see that kind of, he looks insulted. No, this isn't a hostage situation. Why would it be? Here. (laughs) And then they just go with the security force. Because of course they do. I like that. That's that's a nice little thing. And then of course they they build their gun as they're in there. I also like how Worf pleads, not for their innocence or for their release or anything like that. He just pleads that they die properly. Again, another thing that will become part of Klingon culture, you know, dying correctly as opposed to not. And it's also interesting that the Klingon captain also basically says, yeah, no, I'm totally with you, but I got my orders, sorry. Another little tiny insight into Klingon politics. Again, we will be discussing that a lot in the future. Klingon politics is actually something I really love, believe it or not. From an outside perspective, I'd hate to be a part of it, but um, there's a lot to discuss there. Looking forward to that in the future. Anyways... So, 
so then they escape. They bust out, right? And it's not the best action sequence ever, but considering that this is season one TNG, the fight scene between Conmel and Chorus and the security staff is pretty good. Like, surprisingly good. Again, not great. But given what they had at the time, given the limitations of... of, I mean, they were still using those super wide, really dorky-looking phasers, for God's sakes. And he was using a literal made-from-pieces phaser of some kind. But they do a good job of it. They even went out of the way to change the script in a couple of ways uh, to make sure that the Klingon Conmel got hit multiple times, specifically to showcase that the Klingons are tougher than average humanoids. Just... Nice little visual touch there. So, Chorus goes to the core to hold it hostage. Now, I want to mention something really quick. Because I mentioned earlier that a Klingon warrior would never hold something hostage. And I think, ultimately, there's only two ways to inter- three ways to interpret this. The third way is that this is bad writing. The second way is that Chorus has truly gone insane. That he is willing to take a hostage the Enterprise in this case, in order to get what he wants, in spite of the fact that he deliberately went out of his way to not take a hostage earlier. Could be a counterpoint to show how far he has fallen. Or you could also interpret it that he never intended to fire that phaser. That he would never actually do that. I'm totally going to destroy the ship if you don't give me this. All right, shoot then. And then he doesn't. I don't know which is true, and I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this one, because I personally like to think it's the second, that this was a deliberate attempt, because they went out of their way to show the hostage situation earlier, and now they have a hostage situation on a grand scale as a way of showing how much he is gone. And you'll notice Von Armstrong, the guy playing Chorus, does a completely different presentation of him in that final scene. He's, He's practically shaking with how much adrenaline is pumping through him, with how crazed he has become, his desire for his bloodlust. And that also means he is the ultimate aspect of a presentation of Worf's character. I, meant, I told you I'd talk about this. Like I said, Worf's exposition, that's just kind of dry exposition, doesn't quite work. But... Worf remaining true to his ideals, to his philosophy of duty and honor and responsibility in the face of his personal desires is very Worf. They talk earlier in the episode about that that the blood that makes you go out at night and, and join in the hunt of survival that nobody else understands, not even you. And they talk about all this thing what we are getting is actually a kind of a similar thing to Vulcans. Remember, Vulcans have very strong emotions, but they learn how to control them, how to keep them under wraps, how to maintain that kind of discipline. And thus what we are seeing here is that Klingons go through the same thing. They must learn to master themselves and to properly outlet their rage and their fury and their bloodlust in a way that is beneficial in a way that will actually work in line with their higher ideologies of being a sentient, sapient being, rather than lower ideologies of being a beast. What we are seeing in this presentation of the crazed chorus is a Klingon who has failed at this task. Someone who is, let's be honest, a beast. Someone who has lost his ability to maintain this control or this discipline over himself, to properly direct it. And thus, by contrast, we learn about Worf, the one who does have that discipline, who does have that self-policing, who does have the ability to put duty and honor above the thundering of his heart. And I like that, because that is so very Worf, and will help to inform so much of what kind of a character he will be. Because it's not like Worf doesn't have that same bloodlust. That is still a part of his character. Just like having strong emotions is a part of, for example, Tuvok's character or Spock's character. It is what they do with those things that helps to inform the individual. So we get to see the beginnings of this here. And I'm sure anybody who's seen TNG and DS9 can attest, this is going to be a continuous part of Worf's overall story through for the next like 14 years or so. That's a bit of an exaggeration. It's actually closer to like 12, I think, or maybe less than that. Anyways, the point being... 
for about a decade. I think it's actually 11 now that I'm thinking about it. Anyways, long years, many years. So that's awesome. And now i got to check my notes. I kind of haven't been. <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, uh, a couple other things really quick here. I do like the camera angles they used for Chorus falling in the engine room. It was pretty much the first time they were really allowed to play with the engine room set. They've, they've had scenes there before, but they hadn't really done anything with it yet. And remember, they've been kind of adding on to these sets bit by bit throughout the season because very low budget. So they had actually built more of the second floor and more of the, the, the style of the engineering set by the time this came around. So they were allowed to do more verticality with this shot. And I think the director gets some good stuff with that. I also like how Worf does give the Stovakor yell for chorus because, well, crazed or not, he was still a warrior, and he still needs to warn them that a warrior is coming. And, of course, nice little bit of continuity. Do with you it with the will with the bodies. After all, they are merely empty shells now. And then what is otherwise a fairly excellent episode is kind of ruined by a weird we-have-to-end-on-a-laugh-track TOS-style coda thing where Worf's like, oh, just being polite, sir. Uh-huh. Really, sir? Honest? Uh-huh. And you, you could just hear the, you know, you could just see the laugh light flash above the audience. Like, come on, this is when you're supposed to laugh. A very minor complaint. I did still very much enjoy this episode. I hope you have enjoyed me discussing it and, you know, discussing a, a good episode of season one. My opinion, of course. And I hope to see you guys next time. <laughs>